Okay. I'm Maya Hartigan. I'm the founder and CEO of May, and I'm honored to be joined in conversation today with Dr. Lashea Ajayi, the lead researcher of Power Mom, an important new initiative at Scripps Research on a mission to broaden participation by expectant mothers and expectant mothers of color in clinical research. This conversation today is one that Dr. Ajayi and I have, have been incredibly excited to have for some time now. By way of my own background, prior to founding May, I spent about a decade in digital health innovation, specifically supporting clinical research. And to say that women of color are excluded from the research ecosystem, I think would be a, a huge understatement. Participation really matters. And, and it matters because in defining improvements to, to care overall and to maternal health care specifically, we have to consider and understand the totality of experiences that, that moms are having, both inside and outside of the doctor's office, to really add to our collective understanding of whole person care and what that takes. So when I met Dr. Ajayi some time ago, it was really a meeting of minds. And I think we both share this area of passion and there exists so much alignment in our respective work against a mission of contributing to improvements in equitable maternal health outcomes. May is very proud to be a part of the Power Mom ecosystem, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Uh, with that, Dr. Ajayi, please take a moment to introduce yourself and to introduce um, us to Power Mom and, and to share a bit about what you and the team are working to accomplish. Absolutely, and thank you for that kind introduction. It's really our pleasure to work with May on this initiative. So again, my name is uh, Dr. Tulua Lache Ajayi. I go by Lache, and I'm a pediatrician and a palliative care physician. Um, I'm also the Director of Diversity Initiatives and Clinical Research at Scripps Research, and as Maya said, the lead investigator for Power Mom. And you may wonder, what does a pediatrician and a palliative care physician do in this space? And really, my research is always focused on health disparities and access. And we look at, and I work on pain and maternal fetal health research. And when you think about access, um, health disparities and pain management and maternal health care is so prevalent and so rampant and so important. And how we funded Paramom, which is really a research platform that integrates participant information links it with wearable devices to really learn as much as we can about healthy pregnancies so we can reduce health disparities. So we wanna work with our participants. It's participant focused and participant geared to really learn how, what makes a healthy pregnancy for everyone and how can we get enough data to really reduce the health disparities that we see in this space. Awesome, awesome, we're so excited about it. Dr. Ajayi, it's Black Maternal Health Week, right? We're at the start of the week. And for us, I think it was really important to have this conversation this week. And I would love to talk about why, right? So um, let us know a little bit about, you know, how you think about the, the disparities both in clinical research. And I can speak a little bit to some of the disparities in, in maternal health outcomes that we're both trying to address. But why, why to you was this an important conversation to have now? That is so key because I think a lot of people especially Black women, know about the risk of giving birth in America. I think a lot of people know that the U.S. is still number one in maternal mortality and morbidity. And with the advocacy that people like Serena Williams and Alison Felix talk about, about the high death rates for Black women giving birth in America is so stark. But what we don't know and we would, what we don't talk about is how do we fix it and how do we really address these disparities? And that's when we look at how research is important and really raising the voices of Black women in clinical research, Black pregnant people in clinical research, so we can find out the health gaps and then figure out how do we solve this crisis and how do we use the voices, work with the voices who are really suffering the most in this crisis to help solve the problem. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what I think is really, really interesting also the deeper that I've gone in the maternal health equity space is how complex those disparities are, right? And really across every measure, across um, maternal mortality and morbidity, right? It, when we think about the rates of preterm labor, the rates of non-medically indicated C-sections, the rates of chronic disease that we as Black women are entering into pregnancy with, right? Really across every metric, we are faring worse. And, and the complications there 
are not only to us, right? They are to our, our children, they're to our families, they're to our broader communities. And, and I think the reasons are complex, right? And so one of the, the, the critical pieces here, and I, I touched on this a little bit in, in the introduction, is that there's so much, there, there's so much um, going on in our lives, right? Beyond what is happening in, in the doctor's office. And, and Dr. Ajayi, you're, you're you know, viewing this, I think, from the physician's perspective, but also from the perspective of being a Black mother, right? And we know how many things we're balancing. We know the extent to which we're dealing with um, marginalization and bias in our care, at, at sometimes explicit racism in our care, right? And I think a, a beginning step that we can take to try to drive change is really understanding the complexities there, right? And making sure that we are listening to the voices of Black mothers, that we have channels for those voices to be shared, and that we are listening and learning and, and incorporating those, un those understandings into models of care that will work for us as Black women, right? So I think that that's critically important. Um, what is it that we think more participation in clinical research can help us to achieve, particularly as you think about the Power Mom initiative. Uh, what difference do you think and hope it can make? So what difference can more participation really make? When you have clinical standards that are based off of a very small population, and then you try to apply that clinical standard to a very diverse population, you're gonna miss, you're gonna miss a lot of things. Yeah. And when you don't include those who have the highest risk of this morbidity mortality, you can't really change or adjust clinical standards to fix that. You said something as you were talking about how we have missing gaps and really listening to the voices. And I think what research needs to do instead of making our participants fit the research that we're doing. I think it's on us to really work with our participants to guide the research so that we can help find those solutions. And when we get more diverse voices, helping to kind of curate the research that we do to really answer what they need, then we start making the differences that we need to see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that the problem here is so broad, right? When we think about a lack of participation in clinical research, I think what you said is spot on, right? If we're not a part of the research and not a part of the early conversation, we're ultimately not a part of the solutions that are, are built, right? And, and put into the world. And we see this not only in maternal health care, we see it in pediatric asthma. We see it in so many places, right? Where um, therapeutics may be introduced to the market, um, care models may be introduced to the market, and ultimately the efficacy that we see from those solutions do not meet our particular needs, right? And that is really because we've been so deeply underrepresented in research, right? And, and, and I think to, to the point that you were just making, right, we also understand some of the complexities of, of research participation. I know that, I know that, um, I, I understand that deeply from my, my previous life pre-May, right? And I think that it behooves us to really think about flexible models for access and engagement and virtual data capture and, and all of these sorts of things if we really want to, um, to, to extend that, 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 net, that net. So what do you think, I mean, just, just um, leading from that conversation, what are some of your thoughts and ideas for how we can really expand research participation for the Black women that we're so desperately looking and hoping to include? I was, uh, thank you for asking that. I was part of this research meeting with a community advocacy group, and they talked about how when we ask Black women to participate in research, when we actually look for their input, we often take and we take and we ask them to relive moments of trauma. I mean, because a lot of times their birth experience is a traumatizing one, but we don't give back. So I think that we actually, I know that we need to conduct our research in a way that gives back to this population. That it's not just about using their data, but how do we give that back to them actively during the research, right? We want to make sure that whatever you, and we do this within Paramount that whatever you give us, the data that you share with us, you get to own 
that data. You get to see the data that you're given to us. And then you, through the app itself, will get the result. How does your research, how does your data that you gave us really make a difference? How did it impact what we're trying to do? So you get that information back. But also, how can you use the data that you're sharing with us to advocate for yourself when you go and seek healthcare? Being able to track and see what your weight is during your pregnancy, what your blood pressure is during your pregnancy, allows you to have this tool to then advocate for yourself. Maya, I know that you and I both have our own different birthing stories and the experience that we, um, that we had. Me, within my own healthcare system, um, with my first daughter, the blatant racism that I experienced, and the fact that I wasn't even listened to when I said that I was in pain and something's not right and how I was treated. And I had the privilege, right, of being, knowing what questions to ask, knowing how and when to push back and really fighting for myself, even though it was even uncomfortable for me to do so, because I was like, am I really experiencing this within my own hospital? And so to give our participants a tool to be seen and to be heard and to kind of have that community within the research platform that you have the support of other pregnant people to know like, okay, you can speak up for yourself, but also have a tool to show, hey, this is different. And I know this is different for me. Please look at this. It doesn't solve everything, but it gives our participant a way to advocate for themselves, to really empower them with their own data, which is one of the central tenets of Power Mom. But it's so important. And it's just a little bit of what we can do to give back. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, to make the research really accessible to fit your life. Right? We're all busy being pregnant, you're working, got other kids, or this may be your first child. Really creating a platform that you can access, that you can access on your own schedule is going to be key. I said a lot there. <laughs> yeah, you said a lot there, but I think there, there are some really important nuggets there, right? Because I, you know, having seen this myself in my work in clinical research, this point you make about giving back is, is huge, right? And I think that for a lot of people who make the, the choice to participate in clinical research, they're doing it for the public good. They're making an incredible sacrifice of um, their time, maybe their money, if they're taking off of work to, to, to have the time to participate. But most certainly they are, um, they're, they're sharing personal health information, right? They're compromising their privacy and they're doing that from a place of a um, compelling sense of responsibility, right? In, in, in any therapeutic area and in maternal health as well, from a sense of responsibility and wanting to see things change for the people who come after them, right? And I think you make an incredible point of what more can we do to thank people for this contribution, right? And I think we think about this a lot at May from a product perspective as well, is how can we help moms in, in, in better managing their own pregnancy experience, right? What can we put in their hands by way of self-tracking or education or learning that they can then take to their OB visits and understand, you know, this is the right language. This is a necessary answer for me to get before I leave this office, right? And I do think that to the point you were making about your being a doctor and your understanding the buzzwords and the language and, and what to, um, what to, what to, have in place for yourself and what what to expect and demand so many mothers don't don't know right they don't know the right language to use they don't know how far to push right and it's really really critically important that we remember right that when we think about our bodies and our babies that these are our most valuable assets right these are so important right it, it is of, of utmost priority for us to make sure that we're getting that care. And so we think about this a lot at May, you know, helping our mothers to understand, you know, what can you take back? What information can we help you track and understand over the course of the past month that can help you to have a more substantive conversation with your OB when you're next with them, right? And what is the actual language that you should use to, to communicate around some of the concerns that may have been raised over the past month? And how do you make sure you get what you need from that appointment, right? And I think that that's a really, important and critical objective and give, right? Because it, there, there's the public health impact that we're making, but we should also work and support these, these moms actually having an, an incredible experience themselves. And I think it's, it's really the least that we can do when we think about that opportunity. I, I mean, likewise for me, right? I, I think, you know, you touched on the, the experience that you had as, as a birthing person and, and as a physician, right? So I, I'm not a physician, but I've worked on the business side of healthcare for the better part of 20 years right now. Um, and I, I think for me, when I was having my first daughter, I was 
shocked by a few things, right? I was shocked by how um, vulnerable I was in that moment, right? I think that there was a degree of planning that I had done. You know, I had done the birth class with my husband. I had a birth plan. I had met all of the OBs in my practice. I had conversations with them about the birth experience I was seeking, right? And in the particular moment, um, when I was in the hospital laboring for my first daughter, uh, things didn't go to plan and then they don't for so many of us, right? And I think even for me as someone who had, like you, uh, Lachey, like you, ha having the um, medical understanding, the language, the, the knowledge that you had in that moment, I still felt a deep insecurity about pushing and, and where and how to do it, right? And so I think that there's, there's a lot of room for helping moms to understand their own circumstances through the learnings and knowledge that we have of others, right? And, and it really equipping all of us with the tools that we need to make the most out of that, that personal experience. And it is like an area and, and a time where we, um, we can all use that help. I think even, even for those of us who work in healthcare and feel deeply knowledgeable on these topics, the vulnerability comes out in that moment, right? So, yeah. I was gonna say no, I agree. And I don't want I don't want to pick on clinicians because I do think clinicians care, right? We want we want to provide that care. And I think we have that blind spot and we don't even know what we're saying or how we come off or the care that we how the care that we think we're given is being received. You know, obviously there's some that know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that this research and having it be having it represent the voices of those who suffer from those morbidities and these mortalities. And having the clinicians see and hearing from the participants, oh, okay, this is how this is perceived, or this is how this care that I have the best intention, but this is how it comes off as, um, I think can also change the way that we practice. So just obviously we want Parmom to influence, you know, the macro level with the policymakers and those who make the clinical standards, but also just the individual clinicians who see this data from their uh, from their patients who bring this like, oh, I think this is helpful from them to kind of bring these two communities together. Because I think that's what that's what we want, right? We want our clinicians to know that they're taking good care of their patients. And we want our patients to know that their clinicians care about them as individuals, as, as people, um, and those two things to be aligned. And it's, it all comes together. And the work that you guys are doing at May, which is why I love that we have this partnership, shows that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think so much of it comes down to understanding the day-to-day -day behaviors, right? And and we talk about this all the time at May, you know, thinking about um, social determinants and barriers to care and what may be driving for a particular mother um, lower rates of engagement or disengagement around care, right? Because I, I think what we all know as, as Black women and Black mothers is that we all want our babies to be healthy, right? We all want to come out of this experience in a positive way with, a, you know, sound body and mind, and most importantly, a healthy baby, right? We all want that. And so where we are seeing um, difficulties of, of mothers or, or, or vulnerable populations more generally engaging in that traditional care model. I think anything that we can do to understand those barriers, right, and understand where and how we can we can better support those those moms day to day to try to drive that down and to make this care experience one that again meets them where they are and and really really serves their diverse needs. I think is critically important, right? And so one of the things that I also love very much about the Power Mom program is is your your really strategic and specific intent in understanding what is happening holistically with mothers and, and all of the behavioral and lifestyle things that are happening behind the scenes, right? And, and, and how that actually let, lends itself to um, their outcomes, right? So we can we can better understand that whole picture and, and design their practice accordingly. Absolutely. It's, you said it, it's what happens in between those clinic visits, right? What are we missing in between those clinic visits? What's happening in our participants' lives impacts what happens to our body and what happens to our babies, right? And so knowing and working with our participants to find out where is that, what's going on during that gap when you're not seeing your OB? I mean, you don't see those like I think we start seeing each other more and more during the third trimester, but there's a lot that happens during that first and second trimester that we're not, not knowing. And I think, uh, you know, Paramom hopes to capture that data and really 
kind of fill in those missing gaps. Yeah. I mean, one of the really interesting phenomenon I remember from my um, clinical research days was recall bias, right? And, and I'm, I'm raising this because I think I, I would love to talk about um, flexible product design and, and research structures to support inclusion. One of the really interesting things I recall from, from my time working in clinical research it was, it was this, this topic of recall bias, right? So if you saw a, a patient, a, a mother, you know, once every two months, Right, and you ask that individual how they how they were feeling and how they had felt in the two months that passed. You knew that that response tended to be very rooted in how they were feeling in that particular day, right? And the, the ability to recall how they've been feeling or what they've been experiencing for the past two months was was limited, right? It tended to be um, pre pretty inaccurate. And so, one of the things that I love when we think about these digital and continuous approaches for engagement and data capture and self-reported insights is the ability to really um, reduce that recall bias and have a more accurate picture of the day-to-day -day lived experience. And so I would love to hear your thoughts just about adaptive design and how you all are thinking about that at Power Lab. Great concept. And so we took that to heart, that recall bias is huge. And we want it because again, ours is real-time data collection in the moment. And so the first, and the power mom that you people see now is our second iteration. Our first pilot was back in 2017. And we actually had survey questions that go out every week. And because we, we wanted to limit that recall bias, but in working with our participants, you know, and trying to balance that burden of participant research, we're also making sure we're capturing what we need. We spaced out our survey questions through every two weeks. That allows, again, to, you can remember, two weeks, but also in that moment, kind of what you're feeling, um, but also decrease that burden on the participant. Um, one of the things that we capture, so Power Mom has this, the baseline protocol is a large observational study um, that allows us to then dig deeper into specific questions. So for example, there's two um, sub-studies that we're working on. Um, one looks at the impact of structural racism um, on the pregnancy journey and on the outcomes. And for that, it's really key that we actually include wearable devices because your body tells a different story or may capture something that you may not be able to remember or capture in the moment. So being able to integrate kind of what your heart rate variability is doing or what's going on with your heart, your respiratory rate, your stress score, when you encounter an incident of racism, or you have to be hypervigilant in this particular setting. But when we ask you that question in that survey, every two weeks, you may not recall, but your body captured that moment. And it also kind of overlay what your um, subjective, what you remember, trying to limit that recall bias, but also including the wearable information from, and we give away Fitbit devices, or if you have an Apple device, you can link that as well. Um, but it allows you to capture the in the moment of what your body is doing passively so you don't have to do any extra work, but then kind of trigger your memory with this service that we ask you kind of every two weeks or maybe once a month per, depending on the questions we're asking. It really allows us to close that gap and limit that recall bias, but also really integrate what I think a lot of research or researchers are missing, which is kind of like, what is your body experiencing that you can't verbalize? It captures those two components. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I really love that, right? Because I think that um, what we're probably also very often coping with and what I have seen in my previous work is there are also just simply things that we don't always feel comfortable sharing, let alone, you know, sharing with a stranger or a study team or a device, right? And so I think that this ability to track and monitor passively through wearable devices levels of stress and anxiety and these other sorts of things and actually marry that with information that is shared verbally. I think that that's really, really powerful and, and meaningful, right? And so um, just in terms of us getting an, an accurate picture of that experience. Dr. Ajayi, I wanna ask you another question. Um, and I wanna ask you this question from the perspective of being a black woman and a black mother, right? Which is, you know, what is the future that you hope the work we're doing can lead to 
for Black women and Black mothers. And I think about this a lot myself um, as the founder of May, right, which is what was I missing, right? What was I missing over the period of time that I had my three daughters and what would have made that experience more meaningful for me? What would have made me felt more comfortable, more confident, more seen? Um, what is, you know, what, what are different things that would have really aided or contributed to my pregnancy experience? And, and I think that when we think about sharing our voices, right, which is, is, our, is our topic of our conversation today, sharing our voices to support clinical research and to support um, solutions that are built by us and for us. I'm curious to get your thoughts on what that future ideally would look like for you. Well, what would that future look like for me and the two daughters that I give birth to, that I give birth to, and how can this research contribute to that? When I, as you were asking this question, my mind went to a world where we can truly have individualized care based on who we are as a person to have the best outcomes possible. For this research to create a system of care where me and my daughters and your daughters as individuals get the care that we need in a way that fits our life as it is. To be able to give birth in a setting that allows you to have the best outcomes and to know what that is, right? To be able to really paint this picture of a healthy pregnancy for you and to have this care be provided to you in a way that really has the best outcomes. That's the future. I was recently in a meeting um, with one of our Parmam partners and they talked about how, you know, apps can't fix everything. Right, an app isn't gonna decrease racism in healthcare. It can't make it go away. But what research does and what technology can do is to raise the voices of those who've been marginalized, those who've been left out, those who have something to say. And when you can use technology to bring access to that population, to give them a platform where they can share that experiences, their experiences, that helps us create, that helps us make this future that I described more attainable. Because then you're really capturing as much data as possible to then see, okay, these are the gaps that we're missing. And these are how we can work with the different partners, the Mays, the Fitbits, the Googles, the you know, different healthcare companies to then say, okay, this is what we need to really create this future and to make this future possible. So no, the apps that we do with May and Power Mom may not fix everything, but they educate and they give, they give, a, they create a safe space, right? Yeah. To gather that data to make this future possible. They add to the ecosystem that we need. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, you know, and we're, we're both mothers of girls, right? And so I think <laughs> that um, I, I'm sure it goes without saying that a lot of what is compelling us to do this work that we're doing is to create a brighter and better future, right, for, for our generation of girls. Um, and I think that, you know, if I were to just put that question back to myself, it, it is what you touched on, right? M making sure that the, the totality of who we are is recognized and appreciated and honored in our care, right? And a part of that, right, is making sure that we know what to advocate for, right? We, we do understand the shared experiences of our peers. We, we know what we wanna replicate. We know what we wanna avoid. We know how to ask for that. We know how to push for it. We know to have the confidence to change our care team if we need to, right? And I agree with you. I think that there is, um, I think sometimes OBs get a bad rap, right? I think that so so many are in it for the right reasons. Um, I, I you know I think a reality is so is that there is a lot of inherent bias that we all experience, right? And and have and and probably without even noticing it. I, I'm sure I do it. You do it. You know, it's something that we do subconsciously and without without knowing or fully understanding, right? And so I think it, it does behoove us to. Um, be able to communicate openly and with confidence what hasn't made us feel comfortable 
give people a second chance, sure, but also know that um, we, we, we have to honor ourselves and know when we need to make a change, right? And I think having forums and, and trusted spaces to actually share that sort of information and, and again, just lend our voices to the experiences of others, I think is really critical. And I think hopefully will, will lead, us to, um, lead us to a future where we, we are really honored in our care. Absolutely. Can I just say, I will, um, the birth experience I had with my second daughter, so halfway or early, I changed OBs with my first daughter and I had my OB with my second daughter and she made me feel like she knew me and she worked, she did everything she could for me. And, and I switched to a woman of color and for me it just made that difference. Like she got to know me, she took the time to know me and she advocated from the very beginning to all the way towards the end. My birth experience with my second, my pregnancy, my birth experience with my second daughter was just so different because I had her at my side from the very beginning. And it was, I can almost even get a little emotional when she's 13 month old and I still get emotional about how she just worked really hard to make sure that I had a great experience. And I want, yeah. I want that for everybody. I want everybody to have that same care that I did. And it was She's, she's amazing. That's exactly what I was going to say, right? So yeah. we, we should be all, all, uh, all deserving of that, right? Yeah. So that's awesome. Um, we had one question come in, Dr. Ajayi, which is, how do we balance the inherent lack of trust in the system and the need for transparency in this space to get accurate outcomes and, and, and to get a breadth of study participants and diversity? That's a big question. And that's yeah. a question that we should all be thinking about when we do this kind of research. How do we be transparent? How do we maintain trust? Um, and how do we keep the integrity of our research? Um, I think the first two go hand in hand. When we talk about community-based research, it's about transparency. So you have that trust. Who is doing this research? and why, and being open with our study participants about who, who is the research team and what's driving this research, I think is, is number one, that transparency. And you build trust by inviting the participants to influence how the research is conducted to make sure that we're taking their perspective um, uh, into consideration. I think when you have that transparency and that trust, and that allows us to then recruit and have the diverse research participants that we want. When you work with the community and the population that you want to study um, and you're transparent with them, you have that trust that allows you to really recruit more and recruit better. Um, the success of Paramom is gonna be in the number of participants that we have. And that's why we work with as many different channels as we have been to say, this is who we are, this is what we plan to do, this is our future state, but this is where we are right now. And this is how you can help us do that. Um, I think that's key. But if we sit behind these ivory tower, towers and um, are not fully transparent about how the research is being conducted, who's doing it and what it's for, how can we expect participants to trust us and then want to enroll in our studies? So you, yeah. you, you have to have the first two to have the third. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, again, this is a really meaty question, right? And it immediately just takes my mind to um, consent, right? And how, and, and the lack thereof, right? Historically, when, when we think about um, black, black women and their healthcare experiences in different ways that our bodies and our information have been used to the benefit of others, but not necessarily to the benefit of ourselves, right? And so I think I completely agree with, with what you said, right? I think beginning, first of all, seeing faces like yours, right? Understanding that women of color are involved and um, doing this because it's from the heart, right? Because we want to see a different experience for our daughters, right? I think that that it, it's compelling, right? And I think it, it speaks to all of our experiences and, and opens our minds to the why, right? Um, beyond that, I think, you know, not taking consent lightly, right? And I'm sure that you all don't have scripts, but making sure that we are always being open and honest and transparent around the purposes of what we're doing, how we're using data, why we're using data, what we're hoping to achieve and accomplish, and, and also thank you, 
right? Thanking our participants for those very meaningful contributions they're making. I think we cannot do too little of that because I, again, right, these contributions are changing the trajectory of care and advocacy and coverage decisions and reimbursement, all of these sorts of things, right? Really changing the model of care. And, and again, I'll, I'll take it back to where we started. If we're not a part of the research, we're not a part of the conversation and the solutions don't reflect us, right? But we have to be incredibly sensitive given that history in, in respecting, no, number one, just talking about that distrust, right? And, and talking about it and acknowledging um, why it exists and, and that history, I, I think is just, it's not worth denying it, right? It is just a, a reality when we think about healthcare in, in the US and elsewhere, right? But I do think that um, expressing our gratitude and appreciation, being super transparent about consent, making sure that there are women of color involved in study design and execution, um, and just making sure that we're listening to the voices, you know, really leading with um, participant-led study design, right? Understanding what will work for you and what will make this doable, right? <laughs> right? Because the, the more complex and, and difficult we make things, um, the harder it is to, to have a diverse population participating. So that was a great question. Um, another question that came in, what exactly does participation in Power Mom entail for mothers? And what does that experience of participation look like? Absolutely. So I spoke briefly about the survey component. So on the research platform, once you give consent, and we're very careful with our consent to make sure that we write it in plain English, so you actually understand what it is that you're agreeing to do. What's involved is that every two weeks you get pushed after you do your screening survey and you provide some health history about you and the biological second parent um, of the baby so we get as much information about the baby as possible. You provide us information every two weeks. So we ask you questions about generally how are you feeling? In the past two weeks, have you had pain out of, out of control? Have you had um, any new symptoms? Have you been diagnosed? Were you diagnosed with COVID? Um, did you get these vaccines? Did you get an ultrasound? But also, how are you accessing your care? Um, what transportation did you take to get to see your healthcare provider? Did you see um, a doula, a midwife, um, an OB? So those kind of questions about um, your health, generally how you're feeling, and um, how you're accessing care. Those every two week surveys are only take about really a minute, a minute to two minutes at most um, to fill out. And then we also ask you kind of once a month information about how you're caring for yourself. Um, who's gonna support you, or actually who's supporting you during your pregnancy and who's gonna help care for you and your baby after you deliver? How do you plan to feed your baby? Um, contraceptive, those kind of questions. We call that kind of post-delivery care, uh, both post delivery care survey questions, that that's once a month. Then you answer these questions about your pregnancy. At the end of your pregnancy, we have a delivery survey to get information about how, essentially how your birth experience went. Um, and those, so we get outcome data about you and your baby. And then later on, about six to eight weeks after, we'll kind of nudge you again and ask you questions about your general well being. We know that postpartum depression, baby blues is prevalent in our community, but it's not really talked about. Um, so really get information about that. Um, when you complete a survey, we thank you because we appreciate the time. And these surveys, again, working with our participants is meant to be low burden for you, really anywhere between 30 seconds to two minutes to fill out these surveys. You have the option to connect your electronic health records if you wish. You have the option to connect um, any wearable data or any wearable device that you have. For some of our sub studies, um, I talked about the structural racism sub study. We actually give you um, a Fitbit Lux to find out, you know, to thank you a, for participating in the study, but also to get some of that body impact data. We also give you um, a Fitbit scale as well that really readily integrates that. Um, into the Power Mom study. So we didn't give you these devices. 
for the Wobot, the postpartum depression subsidy that we do, we pay you um, for your time. And that's so for every additional survey that you participate in, we actually pay you for your time. Same with the racism study as well. So we give devices, we give monetary incentives, um, and we thank you for your time. But as far as what's involved, it's really those easy survey questions. And then if you choose to connect your electronic health records or any wearable device that you have. There's, there's a lot there, right? <laughs> and what, what I love, and, and even as someone who's worked in healthcare for a very long time, what I love about what you just described is that it helps us know what to ask ourselves, right? So when, when we just think about this, this general concept of knowledge being power, right? I, I think I deeply struggled emotionally after having my first daughter. Um, and I don't think I fully recognized or appreciated that until years later because I didn't know what to be asking myself in that moment, right? And I think with May, we take a very similar approach on, on our platform to early risk ID and, and issue support, right? Where we're identifying red flags and, and risks either during pregnancy or postpartum. I think putting those questions in our hands Again, we're, we're, there's, there's so many things that we're thinking about in pregnancy, right? We're managing physical discomfort, we're dealing with fear, all of these sorts of things that we're, we're coping with, particularly when you're doing it for the first time, right? And I think having this entree to say, here are some things that you should be thinking about or aware of or asking yourself or just checking in with yourself on this week and next week and next month, I think is just so critically important to helping us understand um, how to know if something's wrong, right? And so I love that. I am. We we are rooting for you at May. Um, you know, I'm hoping that Power Mom delivers all that it sets out to deliver. And I hope the findings coming out of the work that you're doing have a huge and meaningful impact on policy and care and how we think about equitable and broad support to mothers and all mothers. Right. So. Um, we are rooting for you at May. I am going to wrap us here, Dr. Ajayi, but I am so grateful for having this, this hour in conversation with you. And I know that this is a conversation that will continue for a long time between the two of us and our respective teams, but we are, we're so honored to be working in partnership and thank you for the work that you do. No, thank you so much. And obviously we're gonna share our results with May. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, so that's gonna happen. <laughs> and I did also wanna point out on the platform, and sorry, you, I know you're trying to wrap up, but you triggered this. Um, the platform also has resources. So in addition to asking these questions, when this like, as we ask these questions, you think, oh, am I doing that? Is that normal? The app itself allows you to A, track where you are in your pregnancy, so you get to visualize that. But we also have specific resources for you for during your pregnancy, postpartum, um, and how to care for your baby as well. So there's Articles, if you don't have time for articles, they're actually direct links to resources to peer support um, to actually advocate for those um, doula support, mental health support. We actually have direct links within the app so you can access it itself. So even though that we, even though because we're a research platform, we can't like, hey, this is a red flag, we give you the tools to know what could be a red flag and then how to access that support yeah. within the resource tab of the app. And, and at your fingertips, right? Yes. And, and in a responsive way based on what it is we 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 know and understand about you. I, I love that and I hope that I I, I hope and I'm I'm confident that many mothers will will benefit from participating and just having that information and guidance at their fingertips. Absolutely. Great to talk to you. Thank you for this conversation. Best of luck. I, I'm so excited to continue working in collaboration together. Absolutely. I know the Power Mom team, if they all could be here with me, they would be, but we're so grateful for you and this conversation and really getting the word out. And I will say whether it's Power Mom that you participate in, but for any, especially Black mothers out there, if you have the chance to give your voice and give your input and research, do it because our voices are important, our voices are valuable, and our voices are needed. Yeah. And I, 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 I think that um, Dr. Ajaye and I would always make ourselves available for, for a conversation for anyone who is considering participation in clinical research or leveraging either of our platforms. And so, um, you know, I think so many of us working in this space approach it from the place of openness and inclusion and really just of hope that we can reach as many mothers as possible. And so always please do consider us as resources as well. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.